Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. If you have your copy of God's word with you this morning, I invite you to turn in there with me to Psalm number eight, to the eighth number Psalm. For the purpose of our discussion this morning, we will be reading and reviewing together Psalm number eight in its entirety. God is great and greatly to be praised. Hear the word of the Lord for you this morning, Central. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the, fall, the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Will you pray with me? Lord God, how majestic is your name. Father, give us this morning a, a greater sense, a greater awareness of how awesome you are. Help us to perceive anew and to fresh your greatness and your majesty, Father, so that more so than what we do right now, we will praise, worship, and honor you. And Father, our prayer as always is this, that you would be exalted as your word is explained. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all who are God's people responded by saying, Amen. Amen. The word is morganantic. It's one that we don't use much anymore, but it refers to a union or a marriage of two people who are unequal in their social rank. Another way of referring to this is a, a left-handed marriage. In, in most marriages, the, the groom would hold a, a bride's right hand. But in these morganantic relationships to convey the inequality of the partnership, the groom would hold the bride's left hand at the ceremony. These morganatic relationships usually happen between a, someone who is of royal blood and nobility when they marry someone who is a, a commoner. Think Prince William and Kate Middleton. That's a left-handed relationship. Or, or think of the relationship between Prince Charles and, and Diane, or think of his current wife, Camilla Bell, or even Grace Kelly and the Prince of Monaco. All these women were commoners, but for whatever reason, nobility, royalty decided to engage in a relationship with them. Therefore, we would refer to these unions as morganatic or a left-handed relationship. Classic example of a morganatic relationship happened some 400 years ago when, when Eric XIV of Sweden 
when Sweden was one of the most powerful nations in, in all the world, decided to marry a common woman named Karen's man's daughter. Prince Will Eric at the time was handsome, intelligent, artistically gifted. He was known throughout the world because of his great nobility. Karen, on the other hand, was the daughter of a simple soldier who became a jail keeper. When her father died, she, she was forced to sell nuts in the market square. And while selling nuts in the market square, Eric took note of her, and he was amazed by her beauty. And what was a passing glance turned into a proposal, and, and instantly Karen Mann's daughter, her, her whole entire life was changed. She went from sleeping in a one-bedroom shack to spending her evenings in, in the palace. She went from barely having enough food to having more than enough food. She went from wearing the, the rags of a pauper to wearing the sophisticated wardrobe of a queen. History records this morganatic relationship saying that though we know nothing about Karen's man daughter's life, that every morning and every evening that she woke up, she would praise her husband because a man like him decided to be in a relationship with a woman like her. That's what you do when someone whose social status, when someone whose royalty, whose glory, who whose honor dwarfs your own, when someone who is better than you in every conceivable way decides to enter into a relationship with you, because you have nothing else to offer them, at the very least, you should praise them. Psalm number eight is a psalm of praise, the first of its kind in the Psalter. Praise psalms are, are testimony psalms where the psalmist will give his testimony about the goodness of God and how God has been good to him in his life. And, and he invites the congregation, the audience, to celebrate the goodness of God and, and celebrate God for who he is. Prior to this psalm number eight, the first seven psalms were mostly psalms of lament or, or complaint psalms when the psalmist would, would complain because of some personal or national tragedy, where the psalmist would cry out to God, asking God to intervene in his life because life was not going the way he had expected. In Psalm number two, the psalmist protests against the nations that scheme against God and against Israel. He says, why do the nations conspire? And the people plot in vain, the kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. In Psalm 3, the psalmist complains about the people who threaten him. Lord, how many are my foes and how many rise up against me? And in Psalm number 4, more complaints. This time the psalmist says, answer me when I call my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Psalmist is complaining against God because of his perceived silence. Again, in Psalm number five, we hear the psalmist complaining. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. Psalm six, more of the same. I am worn out from my groaning all night long. I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with the tears. The theme of complaint continues into Psalm number seven. Lord, my God, I take refuge in me, in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me or they will tear me apart like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Psalm eight interrupts this series of crying and complaint. Later on in Psalm number 10, the psalmist will go back to crying and complaining, but at least in Psalm number eight, he takes a break from his crying and his complaining. The, the structure of the psalm, I believe, is designed to teach us something about the, 
the nature of life and something about our relationship with God. Like Psalms number one through 10, there will be difficulties that we face in life. Like Psalm number one through 10, there will be people who stand up against us. There will be people who talk about us. We will have enemies like Psalm number one through 10. We will have to cry out to God. We will have to seek God's power to intervene in our struggles. But like Psalm number one through 10, not all of life can be about us complaining and crying out to God. Even though in this life, we will have struggles, even though in this life, we will cry and complain out to God, but every once in a while, you may need to stop your crying and your complaining. And in spite of everything that you're going through, in spite of all your troubles, in spite of your difficulties, you just have to praise God for no reason at all. In spite of all your struggles, Every once in a while, you may have to take a praise break and say to God, hallelujah, thank you for who you are in my life. Psalm number eight is a praise break. Psalm number eight begins like we would expect a lament psalm or a complaint psalm to begin. The psalmist cries out, Lord, and though in most other Psalms we, we would allow this cry out, this complaint to, to be followed by, this is what has happened. Instead of crying out and complaining, the psalmist is actually marveling at God. This Psalm is part of what we call a creation Psalm, where the psalmist marvels at the work and wonder of God displayed in creation, the, the psalmist says in the second part of verse one, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The name serves as an identifier of a person, but it's also how we recognize someone in the ancient world. Whatever, whenever a person stamped his name on an object, that object gave us a clue to how this person is. What the psalmist is saying is that if you observe creation closely, if you look keenly enough at creation, you'll get a true sense of who God is. The first part of Psalm 8 invites us to, to stargaze. It is a clear night, evening night in Palestine. And the psalmist goes out into the sky and looks up. It's one of those nights when, when the sky is so clear, the, the stars are shining, the moon are, is so bright that, that you can almost reach out your hand and, and grab one of the stars. And when he looks at the evening sky, when he looks at the stars, he can't help but marvel at the glory of God. It is doubtful that the psalmist knew that the closest star that he was looking at was actually 19 quadrillion miles away. A distance so far that when you see stars shining at night, you are actually looking at what the star looked like a thousand years ago. It's doubtful that the psalmist knew that practically every star that he was looking at that night was larger and brighter than our sun. It's doubtful the psalmist knew that the temperature of the coolest star that he was looking at that evening was some 5,000 degrees. Or it's doubtful that the psalmist knew that those few handful of stars that he was looking at, the, the heavens actually contained over 400 billion of them. It's doubtful that the psalmist knew that the the moon that looked so close was actually 250,000 miles away. The psalmist didn't know any of those things, but he knew that 
It had to be a great God who would set the stars and the moons in heaven. And for that reason alone, the psalmist gives praise to God. The psalmist goes on so far as to say in verse three that the heavens were the works not of God's hand, but of God's fingers. That the stars, the moon, the heavens that he was stargazing at that night were not the works of God's hands, but of his fingers. He, he says this for a very important reason in the ancient world. The moon, the stars were often worshiped as gods. A uh, deity in Mesopotamia was Shemesh. He was the god of the sun. In Egypt, they worshiped Re, the sun god. And throughout Canaan, they, they would worship the moon and the stars as gods. That The things that they were looking at at night was not simply stars and moons, but that these were all powerful gods. The psalmist challenges this, this notion that his neighbors had, and, and he says, the, these aren't gods. <laughs> these aren't all powerful beings. The stars and the moons are nothing more than God finger painting. <laughs> that the stars and the moons are not something that you have to live in fear of. The stars and the moons are not beings that control everything you do. That's just God painting. <laughs> And the psalmist is filled with so much awe and glory at the look at the stars and the moons. He says in verse one, that God has set his glory in the heavens. Glory refers to splendor, to majesty, to that which gives us importance. When the term glory is used of people, it refers to our, our wealth or our clothes or our home. The psalmist says that the only thing that can contain God's glory, God's glory cannot be contained in clothes, cannot be contained in his wealth, it, it cannot be contained in, in where he lives. The, the only thing that gives us the approximate estimation of God's glory is the entire universe. Let me say it again. When the psalmist is trying to think of the very thing that can contain the awesomeness of God, when the psalmist is trying to get an expression of God's glory, he says anything else that God would give us to display his glory will, will do injustice to his glory. The only thing that can give us a proper display of how awesome God is, is the entire world. That's why later on the Psalms will say, it's the heavens that declare the glory of God. Nothing else can declare God's glory. Only the universe is sufficient enough to speak of how wondrous how majestic, how marvelous, and how glorious God is. You don't have to shout, but I get happy thinking about that myself. If you go down to 53rd Street between 5th and, and 6th Avenue, you, you will encounter the Museum of Modern Art, MoMo, MoMA. MoMA is home to, to the most impressive collection of artwork perhaps there is in America, housed in its walls are some of the most iconic paintings of all time. Henry Rousseau's the, the Dream, Paul Cezanne's The Bather, Salvador's Dolly's The Persistence of Memory. And, and true to the name of the Museum of Modern Art, they, they even have some modern art there too. Andy Warhol's Campbell's Soup Cans. He, even if you've never heard of these paintings before, you're familiar with them because they've been featured in commercials and in billboards. You, you would recognize them when you see them, even if you don't know their name. But without question, the most popular and iconic work housed in the Museum of Modern Art is a painting by a Dutch Impressionist 
named Vincent Van Gogh. That painting is entitled The Starry Night. You may be familiar with Van Gogh as being the, the, the guy who cut off his air. It was during a, a bout of lunacy when Van Gogh went to a mental asylum in, in southern France that he looked out into the night and, and he was impressed, he was motivated to begin to paint what he saw. And he, he painted this marvelous oil-based painting known as The Starry Night. It's, it's, it's simply a, a painting of the stars that he has seen in the sky. Once he painted that, and, and to this day, The Starry Night has been hailed as one of the most incredible paintings of all time. One person said about it that it is the most important work of art produced in the 19th century. It is a display of sheer genius. It has inspired songs and, and art critics suggest that if the starry night were to go on auction, it would sell for over $250 million. I've been there. I've stood in front of the starry night. I, I've gazed at that painting. And it's everything that people have said it is. It is marvelous. It's hard not to be mesmerized by the stars on display in this painting. That's how hypnotic a starry night is. People travel from all over the world to come to New York City just so they can say that I've seen one of the greatest paintings of all time, The Starry Night. And when you stand in front of that painting, you can't help but praise the work and the genius of Vincent Van Gogh. And if people can stand before a painting of the stars and praise the man who created it, how much more should you and I, when we see the real things stand before the stars and praise the God who created and formed them and set them in the sky. The heavens declare the glory of God. The first part of the psalm, the psalmist looks up, marvels at what he sees and praises God because of it. In the second part of the psalm, he moves from looking up to looking in. In verses one through three, we are invited to stargaze along with the psalmist and discover God's glory that the heavens display. The psalmist's sudden awareness of God's glory gives rise to the question in verse four. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. Note that the question of verse four only occurs after the recognition of verses one through three. It is only after we see God for who he truly is can we look at ourselves and see ourselves for who we truly are. And after having this fresh recognition of, of who God truly is, after recognizing how awesome, how majestic, how, how inspiring, how marvelous God is, the psalmist looks at himself and recognizes how insignificant, how small, how inconsequential, how worthless he truly is. And in fact, the, the question of verse four is actually a question of scorn. The term what pronoun usually describes an inanimate object. It describes something that is less than personal, something that has no worth, no value to it. We would expect the psalmist to use a, another type of pronoun, the pronoun who, when speaking of people. But after he has looked at the heavens and, and recognized who God is, he says, I can't even refer to myself as a who anymore in comparison to God 
I am simply a what? I am insignificant. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, after David discovers that Jonathan has died, David and Jonathan had this special relationship, so much so that, that David promised Jonathan that he would always take care of him or his family. After David has discovered that Jonathan has died, he, he calls on Jonathan's last remaining relative, his son, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is, is crippled, the product of a childhood injury. And, and when he comes before David, Mephibosheth asks this question, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? And that's really the type of question that the psalmist is asking in verse four. What is man that you should even notice and remember us, God? The, the psalmist looks at himself as being insignificant, as being inconsequential, worthless, little in this world. But, but the question of verse four is not simply a question of scorn. It's also a, a question of amazement, a question of, of incredible marvel and an awesome wonder. The psalmist recognizes that in comparison to God, he's not a who, he's a, he's a what. He's inconsequential, he's insignificant, he's a dead dog, but, but yet and still, this inconsequential, insignificant, worthless thing, God cares about him. Though we are insignificant, worthless, inconsequential, a speck of dust in the universe, what the psalmist marvels at is the transcendent, all-powerful God, the most glorious thing in the universe actually cares about us. Let me flesh that out for you a little bit. In Isaiah, Isaiah writes that God measures the universe in the palm of his hand. It is that God who Jesus has, has every hair on your head counted. In Psalm 147, the psalmist says that God is infinite in wisdom and in power. It is that God that 1 Peter 5, 7 says that you can cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. In other places, God is described as, as speaking the world into existence. It is that God that Paul writes, nothing can separate us from his love. The psalmist marvels at the fact that a transcendent, all-powerful, incredible, marvelous, awesome God can care about a speck of dust like us. God is transcendent in every way, but central God also cares about you in every way. The psalmist never does answer the question of verse four. He never attempts to give us an answer of how God cares or why God cares. He, he simply invites us to marvel at the care of God. The fact that God cares for you, as insignificant as you are, and put it in the context of the psalm, the universe is the universe. It's the largest thing that we can think of, and, and you are just a speck in that universe. If something happened to you, the universe wouldn't notice. If you were gone tomorrow, the universe would still be there. But yet, out of all the things in the universe that God can care about, God cares about you. And if for no reason at all, you need to praise God because he cares for you as insignificant, as worthless as 
you are. You're just a speck of dust, but God cares for you. The, the psalmist marvels at the fact that God cares for us. He never tries to answer the question, why does God care for us? But, but, but I'm a preacher. <laughs> I can't leave that question unanswered. If you grew up reading the Peanuts cartoon, then you know the name Linus Van Pelt. Linus Van Pelt was, was Lucy's brother in the Charlie Brown cartoons. And, and there's two things, if you're familiar with the comic strip, that you would recall, remember about Linus. The, the first thing is that, that Linus always had his thumb in his mouth. He, he always had his thumb in his mouth. And the second thing you'll, you'll notice about Linus is that Linus always carried a blanket with him. This blanket, many people argued that it was some form of security blanket, but, but for Linus, it was more than just a security blanket. Linus loved that blanket. He cared for it. He protected that blanket. That, that blanket became personal to Linus somehow. People even said about that blanket that Charles Schultz created it with human characteristics. Linus loved that blanket more than anything. And, and if you're familiar with the comic strip, you, you'll remember that Snoopy always tried to get the blanket away from Linus. And on one comic strip, Snoopy was successful. He got the blanket, buried it, and Linus couldn't find it. I waited all week to find out what would happen, and, and finally I, I found out what would happen. The, the comic strip went two weeks later, Linus finally found the blanket. He found the blanket after Snoopy had buried it in the ground. After it had rained several days during that two-week period, he found the blanket after Snoopy would dig it up, put it in his mouth, and chew on it for hours before burying it again. When, when Linus found the blanket, he looked at the blanket and assessed the condition of the blanket. He, he held it up and said, look at you, you're dirty, torn, nasty, smelly, and you may, may even be a bit moldy. He, he, he looked at the blanket, but the next strip, he, he held the blanket and hugged on to the blanket and said, you're all those things, but you're still my blanket. <laughs> Central, <laughs> you may be dirty, torn, messy, broken, worthless, inconsequential, of no value in the universe at all. But at the end of the day, you are still God's. And for no other reason, you should praise God because God finds value in you as worthless as you are. First part of the psalm, the psalmist looks up, marvels at the glory of God and praises God for it. The second part of the psalm, the psalmist looks in, recognizes how worthless, how valueless, how inconsequential, how insignificant he is, but yet God still cares about him and praises God for it. And in the last part of the psalm, the psalmist looks out and finds a, another reason to praise God. Verse five, you have made them a little lower than the angels. Verse five is a, is a verse of tremendous controversy. The, that term angels is the Hebrew term Elohim. Elohim is generally translated in the Hebrew Bible by our English word God or gods. And many people dispute how the word should be translated in our text. Should, be, should it be translated angels or gods? And in the context of Psalm number five, when we really look at uh, what the psalmist is trying to achieve, the most natural and best reading of the word Elohim in verse number five is not angels, it is God. What the psalmist is saying is that God has made us a little lower than himself. God has made us a little lower than God. 
Verse 5 may be difficult to translate, but, but it's easy to interpret. In saying that we are little lower than God, the psalmist is not saying that we are divine in any way. The psalmist is not saying that we are little gods, that, that we have the power of God. What the psalmist is saying is that, that God made us with dignity and he gave us his authority on the earth. When you read through the rest of the psalm, he says, you made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet. That God made us to, to be his representatives in the earth. And that what gives us dignity and honor. The focus of the text, however, is not in what God has named us, whether or not we're, we're little lower than angels or, or, or whether or not we're a little lower than God. The, the focus of the text is of what God has done on our behalf. Let, let's, let's put Psalm 8 back in context. In verse 4, he says that we're insignificant. We're worthless, that God shouldn't even bother with us, but yet he does. Now, in verse 5, to give us a fuller picture of how significant we truly are to God, the psalmist says that God has made us rulers over the works of their hand. He has made us a little lower than the angels. He has crowned us with glory and with honor, the, the focus on this last part of the psalm is not on the intrinsic value of humanity, but on the inherited value of humanity. Here's what the psalmist is saying. The only reason you have value as insignificant, as small as you are, the, the only reason you have dignity and honor is because God made you that way, that if not for God, you would indeed be worthless. If not for God, you would indeed have no value. But God, because you are his, gave you value, gave you worth. That's why, regardless of where you're at in life, no one ever has the right to look down on you. Because whether or not you have $2 in your bank account, whether or not you live in a one-bedroom shack, whether or not you drive a nice car, regardless of what's going on in your life anymore, it, right now. Genesis 1 teaches us that we are made in the image of God. Psalm number 8 teaches us that God has made us with dignity. So regardless of how you look, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you have, because God is yours and you are his, there is value in you. The value that you have is an inherited value that God gave you. Let me, let me put it this way. Damien Hurst is, is one of the greatest pa living paintings of this generation. In fact, uh, just recently, I believe it was in 2008, he put on a one-man show had eight paintings up for auction, and those eight paintings sold for a record 111 million pounds, which is, I'm not good at, at, at doing the translation or whatever, that, that's a lot of American dollars to say the least. Damien Hurst was, was in a cab one day, and he took a 30-minute cab ride somewhere, and when he got to the end of his stop, he realized that he didn't have his wallet on him. He began to argue with the, with the cab rider. He said, listen, if you come back here tomorrow, I'll give you more than what I owe you. The cab, rider refu the cab driver refused. So Damien Hurst asked the cab driver for a, a, a little sheet of paper and a pen. The cab driver confused, handed Damien Hurst a little sheet of paper and a pen. And, and Damien Hurst drew a sketch, a sketch that looked like a, a five-year-old had drawn it, and then Damien Hurst put his signature on that sketch, and he handed it to the cab driver. The cab driver looked at the, 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 the sketch, said that it looks like something a child drew. What am I going to do with this? And, and Damien Hurst said, don't, don't, don't pay any attention to what I drew. 
pay attention to my signature at the bottom of the paper. You see, the, the painting might not be worth anything. The drawing, the sketch might be insignificant, but, but you see, I signed my name at the bottom of this sketch. And if you sell this at an auction, you'll get a lot of money for it. The cab driver looked at Damien Hurst and couldn't believe it. And, and Damien Hurst told him again, don't look at the painting. Don't look at the drawing, don't look at the sketch. I know it looks like something that a five-year-old could have done. But what I want you to see is the fact that I signed my name at the bottom of this sketch. And because I signed my name at the bottom of this sketch, what looks like something a five-year-old drew has value. You keep missing it. I know it looks like something a five-year-old drew. It was a picture of a shark with some clouds and a skull. It, it, it looked nothing. It, 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 it was, looked like something that, that, that you and I would draw in the dark with no lights on when we couldn't see anything. But he signed his name at the bottom of it. And that same sketch went on for auction lately. And it sold for $150,000. Not, not, not because the painting, the sketch, had worth to it, but because Damien Hurst had signed his name at the bottom of it. Come here, Central. God has signed his name on you. And you have worth for no other reason apart from the fact that God has created you in his image. And that image alone gives you value regardless of what condition you're in right now. I'm through. When you read the last part of Psalm number eight, it would almost seem that what the psalmist declares is, is untrue <laughs> because None seem like we are made the rulers over the works of God's hands or that he's put everything under our feet or, or that all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild and the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the, all that swim in the paths of the seas are true. When, when, when we look out into the world, rather than having dominion over creation, it almost seems like creation has dominion over us, but, but, but just wait. <laughs> Romans 8 declares that creation is waiting for the sons of man to be revealed. The, the reason you don't have your dominion yet is because God, you're not everything that God wants you to be quite yet, but, but just wait. The Bible promises that, that there will one day be a day when, when Jesus returns and all of God's promises will be yes and amen. And the dominion that God has promised us, we will once again receive. And, and it's anticipation of this why the psalmist can close the text, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Not everything in his life is great, but the psalmist says, I'm gonna praise you anyway because I know your promises are true and amen. What I'm trying to say central this morning is that not everything in your life has to be going according to how you like it, but because you know God's promises are true, you can begin to praise God right here and right now. You and I, in spite of everything that's going on in our lives can declare at the end of our lives that Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth because we believe that God's promises are yes and amen. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord God, just for how you reveal yourself both in nature and in us, Lord God. We marvel at you in nature and 
We marvel at your love for us, Father God. Now we pray, Father God, that in the quietness of the moment, you would reveal yourself to someone's heart right now through your spirit, that someone would enter into a real, loving, and lasting relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that through your spirit, Lord God, you would convict, Lord God, and also you would cause someone to surrender. Father, uh, we give this time over to you. Let your spirit powerfully work in this sanctuary, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.